Hello and welcome to Physiostasis. The first video is going to be discussing the structure of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane has several components to it, but we are going to primarily focus on two components, the phospholipid bilayer and the membrane proteins. So let's begin by discussing the phospholipid bilayer first. If we take a look at this word, it has two portions. The first portion has to do with phosphate, and that is the head of the phospholipid layer. The head is polar, meaning that it is attracted to hydro. What is hydro? Means water. Hydrophilic, meaning water loving, or it likes water. Another way of saying this is that it is water soluble. The second portion of the word is lipid. So we have a lipid component. The lipid component means that it is nonpolar. Nonpolar means that it is hydro, again meaning water, but not philic, this time what? Phobic. What does phobic mean? If you think of phobia, it means a fear, so it doesn't like it. Again, another way of saying this is water insoluble. If something is water insoluble, it is lipid soluble. So pretty much here we have two options. Do we like water or do we like lipids? The next thing to discuss is that it is a bilayer. If we're talking about numbers, one, two, three, bi means how many? Bi means two. So how do we say one? One is what? One is mono. So let's skip two because we just did that. What about three? How would we say three? We'd say tri, right? Trilayer, for example. But the phospholipid bilayer has two layers. Here's a second component to it. So as you can see here, we have an outer layer and we have an inner layer. Another way of saying the outer layer is the extracellular leaflet. Leaflet also means layer. The inner, we call the intracellular. It faces the cytosol, so we call it the cytosolic leaflet. Now let's draw a little diagram of the cell and we're gonna focus on a portion of the layer of the cell. So here is the inside of the cell, here is the outside of the cell, and we're zooming in on this box right here. And we're just going to put water. So the water would be here that you see up here in blue, and then we'd have water here, it would be in there. So we have intracellular, meaning the inside of the cell, that would be here. And we have extracellular, meaning the outside of the cell, which would be right there. And the green line here would represent the phospholipid heads. And right down here, we represent the phospholipid heads here. And that yellow component right here, as you now you can see, is here. A bunch of arrows, but just trying to get you guys oriented to this diagram because you're going to see it quite a few times coming up in the next few videos. So here's just a little video example showing you what this layer is like. I just took a glass of water and dumped some olive oil into it. And you can see water and oil, they stay separate from each other. The oil floats on top and the water is on the bottom. So again, here you have like the intracellular. This would be the extracellular. And then here's your lipid layer here. And then we can just draw in these green phosphate heads as an example for you. Now let's discuss crossing this layer. Only briefly here, because our next video, we will get into more detail about crossing the layer. It is easy for things that are lipid soluble or that like lipids to cross the layer. If you take a look at the phospholipid bilayer, does it look it's thicker in the middle or thicker on the ends? It's thicker in the middle. What's the middle made out of? Lipids. So anything that's made out of lipids can get through it easier. What are these things? These are nonpolar solutes or things that are not charged. For example, oxygen, carbon dioxide, which are important in the lungs when we're talking about gas exchange, steroid hormones, such as testosterone and estrogen, and also thyroid hormones. For example, T3, do you know another important one? T4. And it is difficult for water-soluble substances to get across. We'll talk about these in more detail in the next video in terms of polar and ionic or charged substances like what's Na? Na is sodium, K plus is potassium, calcium, AA stands for amino acids, sugar, glucose, and water. Here's a little animation. We got a little lipid soluble substance. It's going to approach the membrane layer 
And what it's going to do is it's going to push against these water loving phosphate heads to make space and push its way through and get through to the other side. As opposed to a water soluble substance that as it approaches the membrane layer it is going to be repelled by the lipid tails and go up. Here's just a little video. I'm just dropping little drops of water and as you see it's tough for it to cross through this thick lipid portion so they're stuck and they can't go through. So how can these water droplets or water soluble substance go through? Well let's discuss membrane proteins. There are different types of membrane proteins. You have your ion channels so they're basically like a simple bridge. Here comes your water soluble substance and simply makes it through to the other side. You also have transport or carrier proteins that pretty much are doing the same thing. They're very specific. They bind to it, change conformation, and let the substance across to the other side. Now you also have gated channels. One type of gated channels are ligand gated channels. An example of a ligand, for example, could be acetylcholine. It comes, binds to the gate like a key, opens it, and for example, that blue solute there could have been sodium, rushes through, and those are important in action potentials, which we'll also talk about in this chapter. Concerning action potentials, we also have voltage-gated channels. So when you start off with a plasma membrane, the charge on the outside at resting membrane potential is usually negative, and something can happen, such as depolarization, to change the charge on the inside to positive. That causes the conformation to open and allows the solute to rush through, and then the charge change will close the gates back. You also have mechanical gated channels, which is basically some sort of pressure is applied to the plasma membrane, causing the gate to open and then allowing the solute again to pass through to the other side. The last type of membrane protein we'll discuss here are G proteins, where you also have another ligand here that's going to come and it's going to bind to the receptor down here. And this receptor is also coupled to a G protein. That's why you might hear these uh, called G protein coupled receptors because these receptors are coupled to a G protein down here. And when this ligand binds to the receptor, it activates this G protein and causes changes on the inside. For example, you could have ATP and that is converted by adenylate cyclase to cyclic AMP which would serve as your second messenger and cause other changes inside the cells. Last, we're going to end by discussing intercellular junctions. Don't confuse the word intercellular with the word intracellular. Intra means within, so within one cell. Inter means between, like between two cells. I tell people to not confuse these by thinking of an international flight. It's a flight between two different nations. For example, here we have cell one and cell two. So when we're going between these two cells, it is intercellular communication. And the junctions are the joining points between these two cells. So we're going to focus here on the joining points of these two cells. The first one we're going to look at here are gap junctions. So up here we'd have the inside of cell 1, down here we'd have the inside of cell 2, and it's just like two bridges going across and the ion floats through. Sometimes you can get ions such as calcium floating through. Where do gap junctions come important? Especially in cardiac and smooth muscles because you need fast communication for the conduction to be fast and in unison. For example, for the heart to beat together. Because if the heart doesn't beat together, you're going to have an arrhythmia. Basically just a bad rhythm for the heart. The next type of junction are tight junctions. And if you think about tight, it means nothing can get through. So this thing is going to approach this solute, but it can't get through because the junction right here is really tight. It doesn't allow things to go through. This is very important, especially in these organs here. For example, the stomach. What happens is if this was stomach acid and it was trying to get through to the lining of the stomach, if it did, it would damage the lining of the stomach and create an ulcer. So these tight junctions will prevent ulcers. Very important in the kidney as well too. And that concludes this video.